I, my format would not work for TikTok because there is a ton of nuance to this. Critical thinking is not easy, which is why lots of people don't do it. It's easier to just read the headline. That's what most people do. It's easier to read this title here on the video, John Benet Ramsey Mystery, New Evidence That Could Lead to Her Killer. Oh, there's new evidence, so the killer must still be out there? Without watching the video and thinking about it critically. Why are news programs so boring these days? It has to do with deception. And in this video, we'll explore why. I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. In today's video, we'll analyze a brand new 60 Minutes Australia documentary about John Benet Ramsey. I've seen parts of this, so as we catch certain forms of deception and manipulation, we'll explore that theme. This is the eighth video in my John Benet Ramsey series, and if you want to see all my videos, uh, just click the link in the pinned comment below. Without further ado, let's listen. It was a big story, right? Just a lot of chaos. The John Benet Ramsey murder. They made up their mind on day one that I killed my daughter. Three decades on, you can't comprehend that anybody would be that evil. It's still unsolved. Law enforcement never opened that door. But now detectives are doing what they should have done in the first place. There was no doubt in your mind that a stun gun was used. I was about as sure as I could be. Following the evidence. You don't have to be Sherlock Holmes. This is what we call a clue. Find the killer. Take that burden off of my father. Yes, it's been a long time in coming. There's a simple rule every police detective learns early in their career. Follow the evidence. It's a principle, though, that appears to have been forgotten when child beauty queen John Benet Ramsey. This is something you're going to see not just in 60 Minutes Australia, in any news report, any late night talk show, anything you watch, be aware of this. The subtle mockery people use to make you feel bad about not believing everything they say. So here this lady tells us there's a simple rule every detective knows follow the evidence, which implies that if you don't believe everything she and the people who are about to talk say, well, you're a simpleton. You can't even follow the evidence. In reality, things aren't so clear cut. For example, there is evidence that point to the parents doing it. There is evidence that the ransom note was a forgery, was a hoax. And on this channel, we've come to the theory that the most likely scenario based on the parents' own words, based on the, the stuff coming from the horse's mouth, is that Burke likely killed his sister, whether it was by accident or in a fit of rage, and then the parents, in order to protect their remaining child, covered up the crime and staged a kidnapping. Right, So they, they wrote the ransom note. And some people might say, well, couldn't they just call the police or... Maybe they didn't want their son to have the stigma of murdering his sister. Or, let's say they're extremely narcissistic and only care about themselves. Maybe they just didn't want the shame of being the parents who raised a little boy who killed his sister. So the exact thoughts they might have had are irrelevant. The point is that the evidence can show us a kidnapper. It could show us that John did it. It could show us that Patsy did it. It could show us that Burke did it. Evidence can point in all directions. It's up to us to evaluate the evidence. Even the stuff I point out, you should continue evaluating it yourself. If I don't make sense or I don't persuade you, question me too. So she's already setting up a, um, a fallacy, right? So if you don't believe what everyone says, well, hey, you're, you're bad at following evidence. Lindsay was found strangled to death in the basement of her family home. Her murder, 27 years ago, remains unsolved. A substantial reason for that is that local police investigating the crime were convinced John Bonet's parents were the perpetrators. Other suspects, along with crucial evidence, were ignored. But now, a breakthrough. And finally, a genuine opportunity for this mystery to be cracked.
It's below freezing in Denver, Colorado, but 80-year-old John Ramsey has a spring in his step. For the first time in 27 years, he feels hope that his daughter's killer might finally be brought to justice. This is also interesting. So for the first time, he has hope that his daughter's killer might be brought to justice. Years ago, another guy confessed to this crime. Did they not have hope then? How, how were they able to discount, um, I think his name was like Mark Carr. How were they able to discount him immediately when he was confessing to the crime? How is this the only time they have hope? This is editorializing by 60 Minutes to make this seem like it's more than it is. Other people have come forward. This is not the first time they've had hope, allegedly. Right? Personally, I think there is never any hope of them catching the killer because they know their son is the killer. With a brand new investigation. The gruesome murder of six-year-old beauty queen, John Bonet Ramsey, is one of the world's most notorious unsolved crimes. But the terrible truth is, John knows if local police hadn't bungled the case, the killer could have been found long ago. Had the police really been on it with experienced people, this was not a hard case to solve. It shouldn't have been a hard case to solve. Uh, and that's what should have happened. And it didn't because they didn't have experienced people. All right. So it's strange that he says this wasn't a hard case to solve because it's not solved. How would he know how hard it is to solve? Does he know who the killer is? The other thing that we have to accept is that there's not always a good guy and a bad guy. And I see this more and more often in society, in news. Everyone's trying to act like everything's binary. Well, if John and Patsy are bad, the police must be good. Or if John abused John Bonet, then he must have killed her. And Patsy and Burke are good. Life is more complicated than that. It could be that if John Bonet was abused, and I don't know if there's any evidence of that, if she were abused, John could have done it. And Burke could have killed her. They're not mutually exclusive. The same way that it is not mutually exclusive that John and Patsy and Burke covered up a crime and the police were incompetent in solving the crime. So just because I think the Ramseys know more than they're saying and are the bad guys in this story doesn't mean I think that the police are the good guys. Personally, I think the police dropped the ball big time. And that's a common theme across all the unsolved crimes that we explore on the channel. That when the police do their job well, we don't even look at the case because it's a laydown, because it's solved. It's only once where the police fumbled and dropped the ball on a, a layup case that we get involved because everyone can sense that they're being lied to. Well, here we are, John, the Colorado Bureau of the Investigation. Yes, it's been a long time of coming. Um, John Ramsey is finally getting what he's always wanted. At last, a crack team of cold case investigators has been tasked with taking a proper look at all the evidence, which Boulder police never did. They only ever had eyes on the Ramsey family. You know, they... This is another common tactic I've pointed out before in the McCann's case of defense attorneys as well as biased reporters. So this whole report, from what I've seen, is biased in favor of the Ramses. They're trying to paint it as if the Ramses are innocent, someone else kidnapped their daughter, and these new cold case detectives are going to prove that. And this is why true crime documentaries and news reports, I believe, are so boring these days. For example, this is not the first 60 Minutes Australia video that we've analyzed on the channel. In just the past few weeks, I've analyzed a 60 Minutes Australia documentary about William Turrell. 
that I thought was very biased and disagreed with. I also analyzed a 60 Minutes documentary about Christian B., the alleged, uh, the, the suspect in the Madeleine McCann case, which was also very biased. And now we're analyzing a third 60 Minutes Australia documentary in the past few weeks. It's almost as if they're following my channel about John Bonet Ramsey. And this one is also biased. And I think that is why the news has become so boring. And I actually posted about this on X a few days ago. Why is the news boring? Why are commentators boring? Why are uh, political commentators boring? Here's what I said. Liars are boring because they're predictable, especially if they subscribe to a social, political, or religious agenda. The truth fascinates because it's a mystery. I believe that the truth is fascinating to all of us, and the reason my channel is growing is because we're pursuing the truth. We're not pursuing an agenda. If I had an agenda, every video I did would be boring. Because you would know from the outset what my opinion is going to be. If I'm on the left politically, I'm going to say this. If I'm on the right politically, I'm going to say that. If I'm religious, I'm going to say that's bad. If I'm this religion, I'm going to say this is good. And these uh, news stations are clearly biased. You have Fox News on the right. You have CNN on the left. And there's not much in between. And I believe that is why they are boring. Whether you agree with them or not, you already know what their opinion is going to be before you even begin watching. 60 Minutes is not in pursuit of the truth, in my opinion, from what I've seen. They only present one side of the story and they do it deceptively. Especially in the Christian B documentary that we analyzed a few days ago, which was egregious. And I actually titled that one, How to Spot Fake News because it was so egregious. So I suggest watching that video after this one if you agree with me that 60 Minutes is extremely biased to recognize some of the the other techniques that they use. They made up their mind on day one. And the conclusion was that I killed my daughter. Do you have more hope now this year than you have had in a long time? You know, this is something we've been trying to get accomplished from almost from day one, get help from the outside. After nearly three decades of inaction, the cold case review... Uh, Going back to my previous point, so what is the technique that biased news stations and attorneys use? If the police have a great suspect, like the McCanns or the Ramseys, right, the parent of a dead kid in what appears to be a staged kidnapping, They don't need to focus on every other suspect because they have their suspect right in front of them. And until they eliminate that suspect, until they can rule that suspect out, there is no point in investigating the world at large. So if all the evidence points to an inside job, someone in the house doing it and then trying to cover up their crime, there is no point in going through the sex registry for offenders or looking uh, for other suspects. But what happens is the media, if they're biased, or an attorney or a defense attorney in the, in, in the Ramseys, for example, can use that against the police. They can say, the police had tunnel vision on my client. The police only had tunnel vision on the Ramseys. What about this one random guy who lived three blocks away who's a sex offender? Did they investigate him? What about this guy who confessed to doing it three years later? What about him? Why didn't you investigate him? So the more lay down the cases for the police, the more obvious the suspect is, the fewer people the police will investigate, and then the media and um, defense attorneys can actually use that against the police very persuasively. They can paint it in a different light. They can distort the truth. The reason the police didn't look beyond the Ramseys is because in all likelihood, it was the Ramseys. But naive people or gullible people or people who uh, are not familiar with the ways that sophisticated manipulators manipulate the truth might fall for that. Well, yeah, 
the police must have had tunnel vision because, yeah, they didn't uh, analyze that random guy who lived three blocks away. Or they had a thousand tips on the 911 call, on the 911 um, number for tips for, for Ramsey, for John Bonet. Why didn't they follow all those thousand tips? Because they're red herrings. But it can be spun. So we need to be aware of that. Who is the biggest turning point? It would be different if they didn't have any suspects, or it would be different if they eliminated the parents. If they were, if the parents were able to prove, if they had an alibi that they didn't do it, and then the police didn't investigate, that would be a mistake. But until the obvious suspects, the parents, are ruled out, there is really no point in in allocating a ton of resources to dredging up other suspects. Point in the mystery of what happened to John Bonet Ramsey. Tonight, we reveal what the team is scrutinising the staggering list of evidence that was missed or blatantly overlooked. The secret DNA report that cleared the family two weeks after the murder. This is also something I see a lot in my comments where people say, hey, DD, there, there was DNA found on John Bonet that didn't belong to the parents. That rules them out. How does that rule them out? A third party's evidence does not rule out other people in the house. It could just be that someone else's uh, DNA got on John Bonet. That doesn't mean that nobody else is in the world. Nobody else in the world could have touched her. And I actually workshopped an analogy about this on X a few weeks ago. It's like saying that if you taste pepper in your soup, it means there's no carrots or peas. It doesn't logically follow, right? Just because I, I taste pepper, I can't rule out other ingredients being in my soup. It's just that I've detected pepper. The Ramses could have abused her, killed her, done any number of things to her, just because we find someone else's DNA doesn't mean that we can rule them out, right? So it's it's a logical fallacy, right? The absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And it's a, I'm surprised how many people fall for that fallacy. To me, it was quite obvious. They could find a hundred other people's DNA on John Bonet. And all hundred other examples of DNA could just be from other people at the Christmas parties they went to. It doesn't mean... John and Patsy didn't touch it. In fact, it's bizarre that there's no DNA from John and Patsy or Burke because they live with her. Surely the dad carried her in, if their story is true, into the house because she was sleeping in the car. How is his DNA not on her? So everything about the DNA is, is moot to me. It doesn't prove one, th it doesn't prove anything. Someone else's DNA could just be someone else from a Christmas party they were at, someone who picked her up and held her at the party, and their DNA got all over her. Also, the reliability of DNA evidence, especially back in 1996, is not something I'm, I'm an expert on, but I assume it's not as reliable it is, as it is now, especially when we consider how incompetent the police were who first arrived on the scene. What we know is that none of that DNA matched Match anybody family. in the family. Okay, so what? A third party DNA is on John Bonet. Unless you link that DNA to someone, it means nothing. And it certainly does not rule out anyone in the house. But notice how the news, this little guy here, are um, reporting as if it's a big deal. It's not a big deal at all. The forensic expert, who police ignored. I was about as sure as I could be. And the sexual assault of another young girl just months later. You have just months later. This is something that 60 Minutes did in the uh, McCann documentary as well, where they present circumstantial evidence or coincidences as if they mean something. John Bonet lived in Boulder, Colorado, a big city full of people. So you take all those people, 
all those children. And then you expand the timeline by months. So just a short few months later. So by months. And you have one other assault on a little girl. And you're trying to act as if that's a pattern. If that little girl, the other one, let's say her house had been broken into and a ransom note had been written in the house and it was signed off as uh, whatever small foreign faction that the uh, the Ramsey's ransom note was signed off as, that would be something. But a random assault in the same city, months apart, does not a pattern make, does not an MO make. But people get fooled by correlations. This could be persuasive to some people. And we don't know because they have their comments turned off. Which I always think is cowardly. You have to ask yourself, right? Like, could this be the same person? And all that is to say, it could be the same person. However, we have... A good hunch, right? Good, in my opinion, I'm very firm in my belief. I'm all in that the ransom note was written by John and Patsy. Kidnappers do not write notes like that. They do not operate the way that this person allegedly operated if the note were real. Also, the parents of a kidnapped uh, child do not act the way that the Ramseys acted if their story is true. And, um, I break down the 911 call, the ransom note in my video, How to Analyze a Kidnapping, which is also my John Bonet playlist. So if we didn't have great suspects, or if the Ramses were actually ruled out, which they have not been, then expanding the search makes sense. And I would be open to considering whether or not this other person actually is the one who killed John Bonet. It was Boxing Day morning, 1996, in the small but affluent town of Boulder, Colorado, nestled in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. John and Patsy Ramsey awoke to find John Bonet missing. The first thing they found was a ransom note. I'm not going to belabor all the things wrong with the 911 call here. There's an entire video dedicated to that and the ransom note. But just be aware, already in the little segment they played, it is full of problems. Police arrived and searched the home, finding no trace of the little girl. But then, on a second hunt around, John Ramsey discovered his daughter. Behind a basement door, no one had bothered to open. She'd been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. I quickly pulled the tape off her mouth and her hands were bound. Uh, and I couldn't get the knot untied. It was really tightly tied. She had been strangled with a garrote. It was so deeply embedded in her skin that I didn't see it. It's very difficult to imagine a more distressing, gruesome scene. It, it, it just, you can't comprehend that anybody would be that evil. But in Boulder, police were more accustomed to writing traffic fines than solving murders. And that lack of experience would underscore the investigation from day one. Police declared the Ramsey family prime suspects. And even today, almost everyone thinks they got away with murder. There's nothing more dangerous than a police department that's made up its mind because they are totally uh, excluding anything that conflicts with that conclusion. So once again, I, I believe that all options should always be on the table. 
However, when you have all your poker chips stacked up on a certain suspect, do not allocate too much time or resources to dredging up other suspects until the suspect you've got all your chips on either hasn't, it proves that they are not the criminal, right? Until you can rule them out, you should stick with them like a dog with a bone. So I do not blame the police for sticking on to the Ramses. However, I do blame them for their shoddy forensics job um, and a ton of other mistakes that we pointed out in the series. For example, letting John go down to discover the body. That's a big mistake. Or letting other people come into the house on that day. That's a big mistake. Just days after John Bonet's murder, Detective John San Agustin received a call from the Boulder Police who needed his expertise. He witnessed the police case unravel from the moment he arrived. What was that like? Boulder was just, it was crazy. I mean, it was just a lot of chaos. I mean, literally, you had news reporters from all around the world just kind of migrating to Boulder because it was a big story, right? A six-year-old little girl, you know, who's been murdered and, you know, nobody knows who did it, but the focus was obviously on, on the family. And so now you come back to this, you know, it's, the setting right now is actually quite similar to December of 96. There was a Instantly, distance. this experienced right. detective knew it was so that. obvious that someone had broken into the home, a theory the local cops didn't want to hear about. All right, so I don't know John uh, Agustin, this detective. I'm sure he's got great, great credentials. I'm sure he's solved plenty of crimes. My issue with his analysis is it's very superficial. So he's jumping on the obvious, which is we have all this evidence of a break-in. We have a broken window. We have a suitcase. We have a ransom note. The, we have a ransom note. Whoever killed her wrote a ransom note. How does everyone not see this? It's too obvious. It looks like a hoax. In fact, it reminds me of the scene from Minority Report, one of my favorite scenes in any movie. So in the scene, we have uh, Detective Colin Farrell coming across a crime scene with a ton of evidence, too much evidence. And he's explaining his thinking about all the evidence before him. Doesn't make sense. If you were a child killer, you took these pictures. Would you leave them out on the bed for anyone to find they may have been put away. Anderton might have found them. What kind of cop were you before this? Treasury agent. Eight years. This would be your first sexual murder scene. Yeah. I worked homicide before I went federal. This is what we'd call an orgy of evidence. You know how many orgies I had as a homicide cop? How many? None. Bingo. Too much evidence. The ransom note is overkill. The garrot is literally overkill. The frantic 911 call with all the extra information shoved into the call to build an alibi is too much information. It's too persuasive. And whenever someone is trying to be too persuasive, you should be on alert that they might be trying to deceive you. The truth speaks for itself. So the broken window, the suitcase to illustrate how the kidnapper got in. The garrot to illustrate, hey, this was a professional killer because the knock on JonBenet's head, that must not have killed her because there's a garrot around her neck. And a nine-year-old couldn't make that garrot. And then we have this ransom note. So she must have been kidnapped even though the kidnapper killed her. And even though the ransom note said, if you call the police, we'll kill her, but we still called the police. And the time of death could be that she was killed after we called the police but we don't regret, regret calling the police. There's too many inconsistencies. So I feel like this detective is jumping onto the obvious stuff without questioning um, or critically thinking about the obvious stuff. There's an orgy of evidence. And as far as we've seen on this channel, orgies of, orgies of evidence don't occur. 
with real crimes. Real criminals uh, work very hard to cover their tracks. Well, there was a lot of evidence that supported that there was an intruder. Was that intruder theory properly investigated? I, I don't even think that it even was something that they entertained. Considered. And that is a mistake, right? So it should have still been investigated just if it were to rule it out. Right, just to prove that it was staged. No. What I can tell you with pretty good certainty was that there were at least 2,500 leads in the early part of the investigation that literally were never followed up on. Okay, and then here we have that, that fallacy of, yeah, that sounds like a lot, 2,500 leads, and they didn't follow up on all 2,500? Of course not. One person, or two or three, max, killed John Bonet. In my opinion, it was Burke, and I would give him the benefit of the doubt in saying that he probably did it by accident. He was nine years old. I think he whacked her on the head. And then the parents covered up the crime, staged the kidnapping, made a little garro with things in the house, and out of love for their son and to protect their son from having the stigma of being a murderer, went to the length of grinding that garro, strangling it, pulling it tight around JonBenet's neck to convince everyone that that's how she died. Right, the forensics still do not conclude how she actually died. They can't conclude when she died exactly or how she died exactly. She had a contusion on her head and a garro around her neck. And the fact that they cannot determine that she died the night before, she could have died all the way up until after that 911 call was made. The fact that the parents never regretted calling 911 never second guess their decision to call 911. Well, if we hadn't called, the kidnapper was clearly watching us. Maybe she would still be alive. If we had just gotten that money, it was not a big deal for us. If we had just paid, would she still be alive? The fact that they never second guess that decision is a great illustration of how hard it is to fabricate an airtight lie. Because there's always plot holes when people make up stories. And the more complicated the story, the more plot holes we will find. And I'm not going to point out all of them here because there's seven other videos about this. Right now, I really want to focus on the bias of the reporting here and why I believe this obvious bias has led to the downfall of uh, news stations and true crime documentaries because there is no balance of truth. We're only hearing one side of the story here. Why? Because the tunnel vision existed from the moment the murder happened, the focus was on John and Patsy Ramsey. These crime scene photos taken by Boulder Police have been pulled over by the cold case review team now investigating the murder. Law enforcement never opened that door. So For John, these images help piece together the amateur oversights made and evidence that was completely ignored. The first hints that an intruder was in the home are found in photos of the Ramsey's basement. So once again, think of the minority report scene. Think of Colin Farrell. This is an orgy of evidence. How many, of orgy, how many orgies of evidence have you seen on my channel? Or in any other true crime documentary? I know lots of my subscribers are true crime junkies. How many orgies of evidence have you seen? where it's so clear that someone broke in and they use this suitcase to step down and get onto the ground. And then they wrote this kid, this ransom note that explains so much about them and makes it very clear who they are. Yet they didn't act in accordance at all with their own ransom note. But this detective here, I agree with him for pointing it out and recognizing it. We can't discount it. There are stupid criminals out there who, who leave traces behind. But he should also be thinking critically about it. And maybe he does. Maybe he is adding caveats that, you know, this open window is a little bit much. The suitcase under the window to make it unmistakable that someone came in through that window could be a little bit much. It could be staged. 
So if he is adding those caveats, 60 minutes may be cutting them out. So I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt as well. Because from what I've seen of what he's saying, he is right about everything. He is pointing out the mistakes. However, he's not adding the critical thinking, the caveat that this could also be staged. Yeah, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes, right, to know that this is what we call a clue. All right. Although I don't, I don't like that sort of mockery. All right. This is a clue. That so, if I don't agree with him that this is a clue, I'm stupid because you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to notice this. That's just weak persuasion where people have to mock people into agreeing with them. Yes, this could be a clue. It could be a clue of an intruder. It could also be a clue of a hoax. It could be a clue that John and Ramsey are forgetful and left the window open and left the suitcase underneath it. It could be a clue that Burke uh, put that there, opened up the window and looked out of it one day. It's a clue that someone was near that window. But we cannot conclude that it is a clue that eliminates the Ramseys. So similar to how she said in the beginning, right? So detectives learn something early on. You have to follow the evidence with the implication that if you don't follow their evidence, you're a simpleton. Here, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes. This is a clue of an intruder. So if I don't agree with you, that's a, a clue of an intruder. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an idiot. I, I don't like that sort of tactics, especially in a news report. Right. You got an open window. You got a scuff mark on the wall. You have a suitcase on the suitcase is some broken glass. You can actually see some broken glass mm. on the suitcase. So John believes so this photo this clearly stuff. shows how the intruder left the, the house. The but more importantly, what was inside of the suitcase, Amelia, were fibers that matched what John Bonet was wearing when her body was found by her dad, which means that at some point, potentially, her body might have been placed inside of that suitcase. So what does this tell you? An orgy of evidence. I will be the bigger man here and say, that is a clue, just like him. But it could be a clue that she was kidnapped or a clue of a hoax, of a staged crime scene. I think it is no coincidence that Patsy Ramsey wore the same clothes to the parties that she was wearing in the morning. I do not think the parents slept that night. I think they spent the entire night staging the scene. And even in my other videos, when we see them interviewed, they are honest, 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 until they get deceptive about what they did that night, about going to bed. I think it might be in my video four words liars use or my video how to analyze suspects so if my analysis is correct based on their own words that they did not sleep that night it is because they were up all night staging this crime scene i also think it's no coincidence that the ransom note is three pages long full of information it's overkill just like the evidence here of this suitcase is overkill. We have a fiber of John Bonnet. We have glass. Uh, we have a suitcase under the window. So someone had to step up it. It's like paint by numbers. It's too perfect. Doesn't mean it's fake, but it does mean we need to question it. And this is also how lots of uh, like GoFundMe hoaxes are, are, are proven. Lots of people stage hate crimes, for example, and then go try to raise money on GoFundMe. Or they fake illnesses and go try to raise money on GoFundMe. And one of the ways that these people get caught is because they have too much evidence. It's too perfect. So let me know if you want me to do a video about that, about the uh, about grifters who use... Uh, who actually stage hate crimes or fake illnesses in order to uh, paint themselves as a victim to raise money. So the concept of an orgy of evidence, 
I like it because it comes from Minority Report, which was you know a great movie and it's a, it's a great line, but it does have some truth. If we have a paint by numbers, step by step, um, plethora of evidence, we should consider whether or not it's a hoax, whether or not it's staged. Tell you, is it particularly well planned? Is it no? This murder was extremely disorganized. Not only did the Boulder team ignore all this clear evidence, John would soon learn they deliberately kept a major scientific breakthrough secret. DNA evidence found on John Bonet's clothing, including her blood-stained underwear and from her fingernail clippings, ruled out the entire Ramsey family. That is very poorly worded and deceptively worded. Someone else's DNA under her fingernails does not rule out anyone in the world from killing her. She could have a random person's DNA under her fingernails from one of the Christmas parties she went to or from when they brought her body upstairs and people were fumbling with it or peeling off the clothes to inspect her or whatever the forensics teams did. Or just from latent DNA on the ground, right? If they if they had a party, I know they invited friends over, the police were walking around. There's plenty of ways that other DNA could get on her. So other DNA, just like me putting pepper in my soup, does not mean that I can't also have peas and carrots and, and celery and anything else in my soup. The presence of third-party DNA does not rule out anything. So the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And even more obviously, the uh, presence of other evidence does not prove the absence of, of someone else being there. Right? It's, 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 it's ridiculous that um, they're saying this this way. So let me rewind. They're saying that third-party DNA rules out the Ramses. All the DNA does is it rules out their DNA from being under her fingers. So the way this should have been phrased is there was someone else's DNA under her fingers and all the Ramseys were ruled out as the person that DNA belonged to. That's an acceptable statement. It's also why my videos are typically about an hour long because I, my format would not work for TikTok because there is a ton of nuance to this. Critical thinking is not easy, which is why lots of people don't do it. It's easier to just read the headline. That's what most people do. It's easier to read this title here on the video, John JonBenet Ramsey Mystery, New Evidence That Could Lead to Her Killer. Oh, there's new evidence, so the killer must still be out there? Without watching the video and thinking about it critically. Or in the other 60 Minutes uh, video, actually another video we watched about uh, Christian B, right? The alleged abductor of Madeleine McCann, where it said, Madeleine McCann abductor confesses. And when we actually watched it, it was nothing of the sort. There was no confession at all. So the devil is in the details, or rather the absence thereof, right? The absence of nuance is where the devil lay. On John Bonet's clothing, including her blood-stained underwear and from her fingernail clippings, ruled out the entire Ramsey family. But it did... That is not how DNA or evidence or logic works. ...find a stranger's DNA. The significance of this is that they knew two and a half weeks after the murder of this little girl that John Andrew Ramsey, Melinda Ramsey, John B. Ramsey, Patricia Ramsey, Burke Ramsey, Jeff Ramsey would be excluded as a source of the DNA analyzed. There, that's the context. To his credit, they are excluded as the source of the DNA. It does not exclude them as suspects of the crime. They were at a Christmas party that night. She was running around. She's a little girl. She could have been 
playing patty cake with another little kid or been picked up by another adult or even, although I don't think this happened, let's say she was abused by another adult at one of those parties, sexually abused. It doesn't mean that that rules out the Ramses from killing her and staging the crime. On those exhibits. So they knew from that point on they were looking for an intruder, foreign. Uh -oh. So here's the error. The journalist is misrepresenting what he's saying. So he actually said what I said. So to his credit, the tests exclude any Ramsey from being the source of the DNA under John Bonet's fingernails. I agree. That the logical leap, the mistake, the fallacy is to then say, so an intruder must have killed her. That is the logical leap. And the fact that she says so before she rephrases what he said, I'll, point, I'll show you my thoughts about this. Let's listen again, and I'll point out what's so important about the word so. Foreign DNA. Again, right, this is one piece of the puzzle. But what is significant about this is that this is science telling you that what is under this little girl's fingernails and in her, on, her, on her underwear, right? What we know is that none of that DNA matched, matched anybody family. in the family. Matched nobody in the family, but yet here we are 27 years later. No, wait, on her, I miss it. Right? This is realized on those exhibits. So they knew from that point on they were looking for an intruder. Right. So they knew they were looking for an intruder. No. All right, so what's important about the word so? Ever since I came back to YouTube and started doing true crime, I've been trying to track the tells, right? The words people use when they're experiencing cognitive dissonance. So when I'm saying something that should change their mind, but they're not ready to change their mind. Right, so they're trying to hold two thoughts at once, right? The Ramses uh, can't have done it. I can't believe they did it. How could I be wrong? How could he be right? And the very first example I found when I saw a tactic people use, right, something they say when they're experiencing cognitive dissonance is they restate what I said in a comment with so, and then they grossly misstate what I said, right? So they say, so you're saying... And then they exaggerate what I actually claimed without any of the nuance, right? So they de deliberately overreach. So they deliberately m mischaracterize what I said. And they always start it with, so. I have to do some more thinking about why they use the word so. Uh, but that's something I've noticed. And you'll notice it a lot in the media as well. When a journalist is interviewing someone, and they want to mischaracterize what the person said or what they're saying to make it sound worse than it is or bigger than it is or sensationalize it. This is a tactic they commonly use. So you're saying, and then they grossly mischaracterize what the person said. And gullible people don't recognize the trick, which is why I started tracking this. I stopped screenshotting comments. I have some people on YouTube who really don't like me and it is okay for them to have that opinion. And every now and then they say something that I agree with. So from now on, I am going to stop screenshotting the comments I don't like um, with people's names in it. I think that we're beyond that. Um, and uh, as the channel gets bigger, I want to be a better example to other YouTubers. So I'm going to stop doing that. But I will maintain this list. Seven phrases that signal cognitive dissonance. And I'll just read them here. The phrases I've counted so far are, so you're saying, it's funny how, isn't it interesting that, let me get this straight, come on, sorry, but, or, um, um, right. If they actually type out, um, or, um, 
often what you'll find is that they are experiencing cognitive dif- dissonance and whatever follows that phrase is a misstatement of what was actually said. And these people are on the edge of being convinced. And they're just not ready to accept it yet, in my opinion. All right, let's keep listening. Foreign DNA. Again, right, this is one piece of the puzzle. But what is significant about this is that this is science telling you that what is under this little girl's fingernails and in her, on, her, on her underwear, right? What we know is that none of that DNA matched, matched anybody family. in the family. Matched nobody in the family, but yet here we are 27 years later. And the vast majority of people who look into this case think, well, the family had something to do with it. All right, so I think he gave a lot of nuance there. And I, I, I will give this guy the benefit of the doubt. 60 minutes, I do not give the benefit of the doubt anymore at all. We've analyzed three of their documentaries now. They're extremely biased. But this was just the beginning of an epic police failure, ignoring the facts and the experts in their determination to pin the murder on John Bonet's family. So is it fair to say then that this could have been or should have been a really critical piece of evidence for Boulder Police? For more than 20 years as a county coroner in Colorado, Dr Michael Dobison saw evil at work, confronted by death and devastation on a daily basis. But there's one case he couldn't close that still haunts him to this day. In 1997, Dr Dobison was asked by a local detective to take a look at a specific and extremely graphic element of the Jean Bonnet Ramsey murder mystery. When you first saw the marks on Jean Bonnet Ramsey's skin, what did you think? First thing I really thought of were stun gun injuries. When six-year-old John Benet Ramsey was found strangled to death in the basement of the family's Colorado home in 1996, she had tiny round marks on her skin. There were two injuries on John Benet. One was on the right cheek and the other was on the left back. Now, as you guys know, if you followed my channel for a while, I develop my opinions based on the words of the people involved, right? From the horse's mouth, which comes from the old parable about all these bishops and and, uh, scholars debating how many teeth are in a horse's mouth, right? They debated it for 13 days. And on the third day, a stable boy comes in and says, why don't we just go out and count the teeth in the horse's mouth? And that's what we do on this channel. I'm not an expert in forensics. We don't have access to the body. I don't have access to the photos or the qualifications uh, to analyze this, to analyze the forensics and what uh, the marks. So the most we can do is factor it in into our logic of the case. Do I know, do I believe that those were uh, marks from a stun gun? It doesn't matter what I believe, right? If they are, if they aren't, it doesn't change the conclusion of the case. Even if someone stunned John Benet a thousand times, that does not exclude the parents from doing it. So I hope that makes sense, that the parents could have still shocked John Benet. Or I've seen some theories that that's just a mark from uh, Burke's train track, a piece of his train track pressed into her back. So whatever the marks are, they could have come from an intruder or from the Ramses or from Burke or any number of things. The point is the logical leap would be to say, hey, she has these weird marks on her, so an intruder must have killed her. That is the logical leap. That is a leap that nobody should be making. And they were now if the parents were excluded or let's say we analyzed their interviews and they didn't sound deceptive. Like the mother of Michael Monkey Vaughn, who sounds like the actual mother of a missing child. Then 
it would be worth saying, okay, let's check records and see who on the sex offender list purchased a taser in the last year, right? That would be a nice follow-up to this evidence. But as far as we're concerned, we have our suspects. I have all my chips on, on my theory at this point. And if you want to see how I came to my theory, um, I suggest watching this playlist in order because we started off very loose. And as we heard the parents' words, Burke's words, um, we were able to refine the theory. And that is how an investigation should work. Were paired injuries, and uh, both both of the injuries, the ones on her neck and on her back, were the same distance apart, and they had the same general configuration. And what did that tell you? Uh, that was one of the things that led me to think that this really was due to a stun gun. How common were stun guns back in the 1990s? Back then, it was a fairly new technology. And we really hadn't seen much in the way of stun gun injuries, particularly in the field of forensic pathology. But Dr. Dobison knew... All right, so we're about halfway through this video, so I'm going to wrap it up soon. But before I do, here's a good tip for anyone debating, right? Let's say you're debating someone. Let's say I were debating these guys about the case. What you should do before forming any sort of argument is ask yourself, do I even need to argue this case? Let's say I accept everything the other person says is true. Does it affect my opinion? Does it affect my outcome? So here, for example, I'm not debating the DNA. I believe that. That's fine. The DNA did not come from any of the Ramses. The DNA under John Bonet's fingernails didn't come from any Ramses. It, ha it has no consequence on my conclusion. It is not logical that whoever's DNA is under her fingers must have killed her. So I'm happy to accept it. It will most likely get us closer to the truth if we do accept it. Here, the stun guns. If he believes it's a stun gun, that's fine. I think it might be a mark from a train track or any other number of, of things. Do I need to argue it though? No. It could be a stun gun. It doesn't mean that an intruder killed John Bonet. Or the other thing they pointed out that they're going to get into later in this documentary, that another girl was attacked in her home near the Ramsey's house within months of John Bonet being killed. I don't need to debate that. I accept it as true. It doesn't affect the outcome of my analysis. It has zero impact on it. So that's a good um, debate technique is ask yourself, do I actually need to argue this or can I just accept it as true? Does it have any consequence on my analysis? In this case, it has zero consequence. So we're about halfway through this 60 Minutes documentary. Uh, please let me know if you want me to finish this up in a part two about the documentary. Also, YouTube really analyzes how long my regular viewers watch my videos. So if you're a member or you follow the channel for a while, please do watch uh, the videos all the way through, um, even if it's just to help the channel or see what I put at the end of the video. Um, I appreciate that very much. So please let me know in the comments if you want a part two. Uh, please like, subscribe, and comment for the algorithm. Until next time, stay true.